and uh, how this whole thing's going to work out here. So good deal. Somebody says yes, loud and clear. Good deal. Okay. So anyway, I'll just chat with you guys for a little bit here. Give me a, like I said, yeah, we're getting pretty close here. 659 I got here. So, well, let's get this thing rolling here. Um, I want to thank you guys for joining in here um, and uh, attending tonight. A um, couple of housekeeping items. I've got my a separate monitor set up here so I can view what you guys are seeing. So hopefully if there's any crashes on that you guys don't see me or hear me that I can catch it over here. But uh, and the, uh, you'll see my mug up here on the, on the uh, screen here. So um, you can either take it all away or you can uh, downsize it and things like that. Um, you can move it around the screen, drag it around. Um, you'll see on your screen a, um, a question and answer on the bottom, or actually it's, wherever you, it's at the top, I guess it is. It says Q&A. Um, you can click on there and um, I'll look for any questions. There's also a, uh, a chat over here also. Um, let's try and stick with the question and answer tab on top there. It'll be easier as we go through this thing. Um, I got this thing broken down to a few different parts. So let's, uh, so if you, what'll happen here is I'm going to hold off until I get through a segment and then we'll step back. I'll take and answer any questions or try and answer stuff like that. Kind of all in one shot versus jumping around and, uh, that type of deal. So, um, Anyway, um, what else? So we got that going on. This will be recorded and for a future viewing, and, and that's what I'm doing right now. It's being recorded. Um, again, if you guys can't hear me, I've had a couple of people say, yep, loud and clear. So, um, so evidently, if you got any issues, it might be on your end and uh, go from there. Um, again, um, my name is... Kurt Hedquist, I'm a Navionics Marine Specialist. I've worked for Navionics for a few years now. I also um, work with Doc, Doc Sampson, Bruce Doc Sampson, on his Dr. Sonar website, Facebook page, and things like that. Um, if uh, any of you are on Facebook, look up Dr. Sonar on Facebook or his website, drsonar.com. Um, and uh, what you, a lot of what you see here, there's actually more on his Facebook page and his website. So I'm just briefly skimming over the top of this whole thing here. Um, let's see, what else? Um, I've been on the Lawrence Pro staff for quite a few years. And um, so I can hopefully help you guys out if you've got any questions on the Lawrence stuff here and uh, go from there. Um, the, where do we watch the recording? When this is all said and done, it will be, uh, again, it's being recorded. Once I once we edit it, it will be either be on the Navionics YouTube page or it will be on my YouTube page or you'll be able to find it on Dr. Sonar uh, Facebook page too. So there will be a couple different outlets on it. So again, look for uh, Navionics, their YouTube page, and uh, probably give it a in a couple of days, get this worked out, get it all edited up and cleaned up. And uh, um, so, anyway, uh, if I get distracted for a second here, it's because I've had a couple of, I got my side of, I can see hands raised and things like that. And so far, there's 180 of you here. So, um, all you guys be muted. It'll just get too confusing if everybody starts talking and things like that. So, we'll keep it as a, as a question and answer type deal here. And, uh, um, go from there. So let's uh, get this thing rolling here and um, kind of go through this. What I got here is understanding sonar and kind of give you my itinerary here. So um, the first part of this whole thing is going to be understanding traditional 2D sonar and chirp. And I got some slides and things like that I'm going to go through. Um, the second part, understanding structure scan. And just let me back up for a second here. Now, a lot of this will be like based on Lawrence screenshots and information and things like that. And I'm not really gonna go delve into Lawrence settings and things like that. What I got is a lot of screenshots and things like that. So what I wanna help you guys do is help you understand what you're looking at. Both products, Humminbird, um, they all do the same thing. They're all showing structure at the bottom. Um, it's just a matter of understanding what you're seeing. So. 
Again, what you're seeing is Lorant screenshots, but if you're running the Humminbird, Garmin, whatever, Raymarine, you'll be able to transfer this information over into that. So, um, so anyway, let's, uh, again, we'll hold off till I get to the, let's say at the end of a section here, you'll see how it's bro broken down here. So the first section we'll go through is understanding traditional 2D sonar and chirp. And when I get to the end of this, if you got any questions on that, I'll cover that and then we'll move on to the next portion here. So um, what we're gonna, when we go into understanding structure scan, we're gonna break it down into down scan, side scan, and then we're gonna briefly touch on structure scan 3D. It's a new technology from Lawrence. I have not had a chance to use it on the water yet. I just got it. And then we're gonna go through some settings and tips and things like that. So it's uh, kind of how it's all broken down here into different segments. And uh, let's get rolling here. Um, well, we almost got 200 people here, which is pretty cool. So um, we'll uh, get this thing going here. So we're gonna start at the Sonar Basics. Again, like I said, I've worked at Doc Sampson for a few years and stuff like that. And this is kind of how we start out. Um, the Sonar Basics kind of, so everybody knows what's going on here. So um, Sonar Basics, Transducer is a transmitter and receiver of sound. Um, that's a little black thing that hangs in the back of your boat. And um, that's that uh, there's either, you know, either got side scan, down scan, or, you know, a, combi a combination of each and the other ones. Um, so a ping is, the, is each pulse of sound that is sent from the transducer. Echo is the sound returning to the transducer and a target is anything that the sound reflects off of. So fish, bottom, rocks, weeds, and things like that. Another thing that the transducer does is it basically measures distance from the transducer to a target or an object. So you can see by my little arrows there, what I got going on there and uh, how, that all, how that whole thing plays out. Um, 2D sonar cone, we're gonna, I'll give you a little, each one's a little bit different. Again, what I'm going off of here is just kind of a rule of thumb. 200 hertz, pretty standard on everybody's, most people, most manufacturers' sonars. For example, a Lowrance. For every three feet of depth, there's approximately one foot of coverage in diameter. So six feet is two feet and so on and so forth. You do the math. Um, it's a circular cone that goes down below the boat. And uh, so as you, um, And uh, so anyway, that's how that all works out. How does sonar, how does a sonar make a fish arch on a standard sonar? Basically a transducer, we're gonna go through this little, I get the next some really nice slides here. Um, transducer measures distance to a target. Fish arch is created from two sets of data, distance of the fish from the transducer and strength of echo return from the fish. Um, big question I get a lot of times is uh, I'm not seeing the um, um, I'm not seeing fish arches and stuff like that. We'll kind of go over that a little, little more in depth here as to why you may not be seeing fish arches and things like that, um, so on and so forth. So, um, so basically, what's what a transducer is doing? It's is it's measuring distance uh, of a fish to the transducer. Where that's how fish arches are created, and the strength of the echo return from the fish. Um, how does a 2D sonar make a fish arch? On, how, does a, how does a sonar make a fish arch on 2D sonar? So, um, what I got down below here is a nice little picture down here of um, basically your transducer out the back of your boat. Uh, well, I'll start at the top here, right here. This will be your. This will be the uh, fish arch here. This is what you'll see in your sonar, and then there's there's a nice little animation going on here. So. Remember, the fish arch is created by measuring distance from the transducer. So if you look here, the fish is furthest away from the transducer as it enters the cone. And as it moves through, and it's not, the fish doesn't change depth. It's what it's doing is it's moving through underneath the, underneath the boat and staying flat. So as you get closer to the trans, transducer, it's getting closer. It's getting closer to the transducer, so that's the highest part of the fish. So as you move across here, 
it's a little jerky on your side there. You'll see how, it, uh, basically that's how a fish arch works out. It's, um, you, the tail starts out in the front part of the cone. The fish moves through the cone and um, the top of the arch is typically the closest to the transducer, typically the, the, the actual depth of the fish. As the fish leaves the transducer or the cone, it tails off and that's where you get your fish arch from. So um, up here on my screen right here, um, you'll see on most 2D sonar on the right hand side of your screen is the um, most current data below the transducer as that fish moves across the screen, screen that's in the history and so on back through here. So. Um, another thing that affects fish arches is the speed that you're moving. Uh, if you're sitting still, many of you have seen sitting on top of fish like you're vertical jigging, you'll basically get a flat line. As you start moving, you start getting that fish arch where the fish is moving through the transducer cone. And as you get move faster and faster, that fish is in that cone less and less. So you're, you're, um, fish arch decreases in length until you're, you know, assisting that transducer cone just for, for a brief moment. Sizing fish. Well, I got a little, um, close this out here. So I did, I'll answer this gentleman's question. Fish size. Uh, fish size on your sonar is determined by three factors on the transducer receiving sound reflected by the fish. Larger fish reflect more sound than a smaller fish. Thick arches are bigger fish than thin arches since the thickness indicates a stronger echo return. Color is determined by the strength of the returning sound to the transducer. Bigger fish reflect more sound, so the bigger fish will have different colors. So if you look at my little um, screenshot up above here, the small fish, very little echo return, there's small blue arches. And the uh, bigger fish down at the bottom, obviously have returning more sound back to the transducer. And um, so you're gonna get a bigger fish arch that way. Um, so there's basically three factors that kind of determine the, um, a fish arch or fish size on the screen. So uh, small fish on the top there and um, larger fish down below here. So, you know, don't fish the blue arches, use them as bait. Um, bottom hardness. Bottom hardness is determined by sonar with three sonar methods since harder bottom reflects sound echo better than soft bottom. So what I got here is a kind of a screenshot of going transitioning from a soft bottom to a hard bottom and then back to a soft bottom. So, um, so anyway, hard bottom reflects sound better. So you're going to get a thicker band on the bottom on your, on the bottom like that. And if you are, Deep enough, you may see a second echo like that. So what that is, is a sound bouncing off the bottom. It's hitting the top, hit, going back up, hitting the water surface, and then coming back down. And, and so it, then it's returning back to the transducer. So it's actually traveling through the water column twice. And if you have your depth set deep enough like this, you will see the second echo. Color indicates echo strength and yellow on the palette choice on this palette choice relates to the strongest echo. Thickness of the bottom band, second echo only shows, shown on the left side with the white arrow. Let's see what we got going on here. Um, so we, we've got some questions going on here and I'll get to those, I'll jump, when we get to the end of the session, I'll jump back and we'll answer those questions a little more in depth here. So, and, uh, Uh, here's another example of bottom hardness. You can see we're transitioning from a hard bottom over here to the left side of the screen. We then travel through a, I remember you got a little bit of a delay there. Um, 
Okay, get on the left-hand side of the screen here, we got a hard bottom, then we transition into a soft bottom here. The, remember, the sound is being absorbed into the bottom. Transition into a hard bottom surface here, so we got more sound being reflected back to the transducer. And then we move back and we transition to a soft bottom over here. Uh, thermal clines. You know what, maybe I'll stop here for a second and answer some of these questions I got going on here, so we'll get caught up here. Um, why do I see half arches? Is, my, is it my transducer's not set up properly? Um, Donald asks. It is possible that you don't have your transducer set up properly. Maybe it's tilted, you get, uh, it's maybe tilted too far forward or too far back. Um, it's quite possible. Um, Many times, yeah, I would say, Donald, that I would check your transducer to see if you're set up, if you're, um, if you're not set up correctly. Maybe it's tipped too far back. Does sonar paint the top of the fish body, or is it seeing the air bladder inside of the fish, which is different density than the water? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's hitting it. The uh, James asks, does the sonar um, paint the top of the fish arch or fish fish's body. No, it's hitting the air bladder inside. Sean, so yellow bottom is hard. Yes, it is. The thicker the arch actually is what it is. So the, with the color palette I'm using, it's going to show up as a, the thicker band of yellow will be a harder bottom. Um, let's see here. Dan asks, I usually see fish, I usually fish in water no more than 10 feet. You mentioned that three feet of coverage equals one foot of, three feet of depth only equals one foot of coverage by cone. Would it even be worth having a fish finder since most of the fish I fish are shallow? Well, you know, you can, yeah, unless you're sitting over the fish, you know, you basically, you know, you got a fairly narrow cone. I have had that question, no, I can't see fish below my transducer and I'm fishing in the front of the boat. It's quite possible, yeah, you're just shallow enough, you're not going to be able to see any, um, your cone angle so small. If you're in front of the boat and your transducer's in the back, you may not see any fish or if you're casting over the side. So, you know, it's uh, fish mainly shallow water. It's going to be basically just going to tell you bottom depth. Um, Mark asks, are the screenshots using pallet one? Yes, they are. Uh, tarp and show up really large. I bet they do. <laughs> um, what palette color are you showing? Uh, palette one. And then I got a question on side scan. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I never see fish arches, but the bottom well. I'm using. I'm catching fish. So the sense is it is this a sensitivity issue? Um, using a chirp through hull. TM transducer. Um, it's, are the fish tight to the bottom? I guess we'll talk about that here in a little bit. I guess it depends on where the fish are in the water column. How deep are you fishing? Um, you know, the cone angle of the TM50 transducer. I'm not real familiar with that transducer. So it's quite possible that you're, um, uh, you're not seeing them just because they're not in the cone angle. I fish mainly PNW ocean plus or minus 200 feet and wanting to know if the current can create a return. I see a lot of blue clutter on the bottom or near the bottom of the water column, but not any bait. That's what Tim asks. It's quite possible you get a change in density and ask actually the screen I show right here right now in thermocline kind of will maybe answer that question. Um, so what we got here, this is a lake in Minnesota. And middle of summer, we got a thermocline that's set up in about uh, 35 feet of water. So um, if you have, if you think you got a thermocline and you're not seeing it, you can turn up the sensitivity, and that thermocline will start to appear. And of course, you're probably not going to see any fish below the thermocline. Um, and it's just, it's very similar. If there's uh, if you got a current or something down there, you might have a change in water density. And so if you're seeing a nice long, you know, flat bottom like that, you may have a thermal client set up or some sort of change in density in water. And um, you can typically, like I say, this is on normal settings in Minnesota here. And I was able to see this on a lake here. 
on a thermocline in the middle of summer. Let's see what we got going on here. Uh, let's see here, one more. What do we got going on here? So Donald Campbell asked, do you always run 200 hertz for most of your scanning? Yeah, typically I run 200 hertz or we'll touch brief, briefly on chirp. I've been playing a little bit with the chirp on my Lawrence unit, but typically, yes, 200 hertz is pretty much what I run for scanning. It gives me the best uh, target definition, uh, bottom composition and things like that. So is it possible to tell the direction of the fish are facing? Not necessarily, no. I'm not on 2D sonar. Um, I got some really cool screenshots on downscan, but uh, no, I was. I would be very tough to tell which way the fish is facing. Um, I was told by the shop that something like I could mount the transducer inside of my hull as long as there's no air between the transducer and the hull. As long as you got a, that's Stuart asked that, as long as you have a really good seal, Yes, you probably can. It's like would be like mounting in a, in a fiberglass um, hull. I'm I'm sure. Um, what I would do, Stuart, is I would lay it in the bottom there, maybe pour some water in there, and see if that works. Uh, let's see here. Um, but yeah, Stuart, getting back to you. Um, yeah, you want to have a very tight seal on the bottom of your kayak so you have no air between the transducer and the hull. Um, you can try it. What some people sometimes do with that is they'll put a bit, a little, little bit of water in the bottom of the hull and then lay your transducer on the bottom and see if you get a good picture. Um, I run a fiberglass boat and um, I have mine externally mounted. I just found that I get better picture and stuff like that. It just just everything works a little better on the external on my boat. Uh, Ken, we will get to your question here in a little in a little at the end here. I got some stuff on settings. Um, let's see here. Jerry asked, is that small ball on the left along the small fish on symbols? Yeah, there's probably some small fish right here, right up here where my arrow is right there. You see a little bit of yellow like that. There's probably some small fish right there and uh, quite possibly, you know, picking up some small fish along through here also. Let's uh, move along here. Um, what we got here is fish tight to the bottom with this palette color. So um, we'll, uh, I just wanted to give you an example of what fish tight to the bottom may look like. You'll notice maybe just a little bit of a target separation below the fish right here, where my, where my pointer is right here. Right here is probably just a little bit of a target separation right there. Um, those I would have to say to me would be fish tight to the bottom on this. And uh, so I just want to give you an idea what that would look like. Um, Here's an interesting screenshot I gathered a couple of years ago. It is a fish swimming along with the boat. I thought this was rather interesting. So as you can see here, the fish, my red arrows are pointing towards fish right here. And so what happened here, the fish didn't actually probably swim off the bottom, but it probably, it may, right back here, it probably came up off the bottom a little bit. And then it, it swam along with the boat underneath the transducer, almost like it was vertical jigging. It just kind of kept along with the boat here, follow my arrow, my pointer. And then what happened here towards the right, towards the um, side here is that the, actually I'm doing this backwards here. Um, the fish on the right hand side here is the most current data. So what happened here is the fish entered the cone and then it uh, moved closer and closer to the center and then it tapered off here. Oh, let's see, hold on, I get that backwards. So, pardon me. So, um, fish on the edge of the cone is on the right hand side here. So that fish moved away from the center of the cone. If you think, remember back, um, 
outside of the cone is the weakest signal, so that fish will just swam off to the side of the cone. Um, here's some nice fish arches right here. I got going on right here. Um, over here on the side of the screen right here is the amplitude bar. And uh, I typically turn that off on, for me in your settings. I don't like to run that, but I just thought I'd give you a good example of some really nice fish arches right here. So fish nice, nicely stacked up here. Um, let's see here. Let's uh, continue on. So um, chirp. We'll answer some questions on chirp here. Chirp is compressed, came out of the saltwater market more or less. Chirp is compressed high intensity radar pulse is what it kind of would stand is what it stands for. What is it? It sends out multiple multiple frequencies pulsed at one time instead of one. Multiple chirp levels mid, high, and low. There's, so there's, if you look on the right-hand side of my screen below my picture right there, I've kind of got a representation or just an equivalent range. Um, why? Why is chirp? Better target separation, better deep water, works better in deep water. It gives you a sharper image, and it gives you a little better, a little clearer screen. How does it work? It sends a continuous sweep of frequencies ranging from high to low. Uh, the continuous sweep of frequencies provides chirp with more information and it interprets the frequencies individually upon their return. So um, a lot of the newer Lorant stuff is coming with chirp and those of you that have had it, have it, play with it, jump between high chirp and 200 hertz. What I found is that at certain conditions, high chirp will give me a little bit better target separation a um, little bit better screen clarity, but I would have to say majority of the time right now, I run 200 hertz. Um, here's a good example of high chirp versus 200 hertz. Um, the shots are taken over the same target using the same boat, same transducer, same time and everything like that. And you'll notice in the high chirp mode that the targets stand out from the bottom, while in 200 hertz, they're just a blip on the bottom. They just, they're tight to the bottom. So again, chirp will give you, at times, better target separation, um, things like that. I use it for ice fishing, high chirp, and it works very well for, for chirp, high chirp for ice fishing. So, um, so those of you that have it, play with it, you can jump back and forth. Okay, let's take a little break here. I'm gonna answer a few more questions before we jump into structure, understanding structure scan. Um, let's see here. And uh, can, you, can you answer the question on what a two pound largemouth arch would look like compared to a large, uh, compared to an arch on a five pound largemouth? Um, that will be very difficult to tell, in my opinion. Um, you may see a little bit different, maybe a little thicker band, you know, the yellow in the arch, but the fish have to be almost, you know, fairly close to each other because if they're off to the side a little bit, um, you know, it may, they may look very similar, but boy, telling the fish size is very difficult. Um, but, you know, if you're going from the really small fish, you know, like where you're getting blue arches to a larger fish, again, um, it'll be very similar, very difficult. Uh, Tyler asks, is there a way to tell which side of the cone the fish may be on? Not no, you can't, not necessarily, because if you think of the cone, all that information is, is that's collected by that transducer and that circular, that 20 degree cone is all compressed into one vertical, vertical, on, um, vertical readout on the right hand side of the screen. So it's very difficult on the right hand screen to tell which side of the, where, the, where it is on that on 2D sonar. What speed do you have your sonar screen advance at? I leave mine advance at, uh, well, Lawrence, it's on ping speed. I just leave my ping speed set at high and, um, go, and just leave it there. So I just typically leave it on just OEM setting typically. Um,
Mark asks, um, let's see here. Um, on some of your screenshots, there's a lot of clutter between the surface and the bottom. Can you remove the clutter? And if so, is there a disadvantage to doing so? Yes, there is. And I'll cover that in some of the settings, Mark, a little bit further here. Um, if you're running a higher speed, could amplitude help? Um, are you talking hertz? Yes, the, um, you'll typically get a better readout with a 200 hertz versus 50. Um, Jason asked, I have a question about Chirp and not using it. I live here in New Orleans in Southeast Louisiana, living in the Sportsman's Paradise. We have underwater structure all over, especially. Just... What would you recommend as far as using Chirp or without? Can you recommend the best way to identify how close the big structure could be as far as identifying structure that is the best resolution for 200 hertz? Thanks. Um, I guess the, you know, the best thing we're going to, we'll go through a uh, structure scan here a little bit, but a lot of this stuff, a lot of really cool things will be cleared up in structure scans. Um, Rex asks, what is the, what settings would you use in shallow water? Um, I typically leave everything in auto and let the machine do, do operate itself. Is there a minimum depth that where chirp is effective? Ken asks. Not necessarily. It's uh, again, the uh, 200 hertz is very similar to high chirp, and I run it pretty, you know, like I said, it's a little bit of trial and error. Um, not necessarily. I've used it in very shallow water also. At what speed does 2D become unreliable? I'm assuming that you're talking about high speed. As long as you can maintain bottom contact, it should be real time. Um, how does how about screen scroll speed? Um, again, I typically leave mine in auto. Some some units can adjust the scroll speed and things like that. I typically just leave mine in auto or just leave it standard. Hi, Brenda, I'll get to your question. Um, Austin asks, here in South Louisiana, we've got a lot of, we've got a buffet of water bodies, conditions to fish with, from shallow swamps to the infamous Toledo Bend. I'm assuming that minimum depth of 15 feet or greater that I'm scanning. If running 200 hertz or 283 hertz, what other settings necessarily adjusted, uh, necessarily adjust the clarity of the picture? We can get into that in the settings. Um, let's see here. Hold on a second. Anonymous viewer, if I haven't missed it already, can you give me a good going over of how, what bottom structure shows up like mud, sand, rocks, and weeds. Um, we did go cover that. That was the bottom hardness and things like that, the going from soft to bottom, or soft to hard on that. Um, let's, uh, let's move on here a little bit. And like I said, if I don't get to all your questions, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll spend some time with you guys here later on, and uh, we'll go through the rest of them here. Let's keep moving on here. And uh, I'll try and get to all your questions here. So I apologize if I don't get them all, but there's, uh, I got like, I think there's like 200 some people, 225 people asking questions here. So I'm gonna try and keep up with them. Um, understanding structure scan. We're gonna go through, the first thing we're gonna go through is down scan. And down scan is a great tool for um, talking to, for, um, for a great search tool, what it does, what downscan will do, it will teach you what's down below there. So let's go over that real quick, go over that, how that all works out. Um, then we're gonna go through side scan in the second part, and then we're gonna touch base on structure scan 3D. Um, how does 2D differ from structure scan? Let me get a drink here.
2D operates at a lower frequency. 2D is a wider cone front to back, if you remember at the very first screen. 2D has less detail and target separation. 2D works at all speeds, basically. Structure scan is a higher frequency. Structure scan is a, high, is a narrower cone footprint front to back. Structure scan wider has a wider cone or foot, footprint side to side. And structure scan gives you more detail or target separation. And structure scan works better at low speeds. My easiest way to explain to people is that your standard 2D sonar works like an x-ray. It gives you, you know, tells you what's down there and things like that. Um, I might get a couple examples here of a hand. But uh, when you go to the doctor, you can say you get a broken bone or something like that. Or you go to the doctor and you get an x-ray. And they say we need more information. You go back in for a CT scan, which in my, in my is way I can equate how structure scan works out here. So it gives you a lot better detail. It works at a higher frequency. And it draws things out better. And it's a narrower cone front to back. So we'll kind of go over that whole thing, how that all works out. So what we're going to go over first here, let my screens catch up here. There we go. Is what we're going to talk about first is the down scan, this center section right here, the yellow portion right here. And um, then, of course, we got the side scan, the blue sides off to the side here, and then both sides. So, and down below here, I got a little, just a little bit of a representation of what, you're, what you would see on the screen. So, let's uh, go on here a little bit. So, here is what I got going on here is my uh, is a comparison of your standard sonar cone it is a larger is blue right here so you can see just just a rough representation of what it would look like and then what you got is your down scan cone off to the side of the boat right here so you can see it's a narrower cone front to back but it's also wider and um, down below here I Give you an example of how it would look on your screen. So on the right hand side of your screen, with the boat traveling to the right, the current data will appear on the right hand side of the screen. Everything on the left hand side is all history. So as you travel along here, down scan will appear on your screen like this, is, is how it'll appear as you're traveling across with down scan. Um, Beauty of downscan is those of you that have it, there we go. Um, it gives you better target separation. What I find it does is it teaches you what's, what, you're, what you're looking at on your 2D sonar. If you remember back into the 2D portion of this thing here, I had a screenshot showing two fish laying real tight to the bottom. And it was hard to tell, you know, that they were, they were fish, they, you know, if you didn't, weren't paying attention to me, I thought they were rocks or so, just a log or something laying on the bottom. But if you look over on the left-hand side here, you can see the two fish, you can see the target separation right below here. So, I, uh, so that's where I find is down scan is a great tool to teach you what you're looking at on 2D. I run them very, I, most, I pretty much run them side by side all the time. I run 2D and then I run my down scan if I'm fishing. Um, it just, the target separation is that much better. Um, here's another representation of 2D versus down scan. Again, um, what you see here on 2D is a lot of, you know, fish arches are all kind of clumped together. But if you look down below here, on your down scan, you can see multiple fish, the target separation and things like that. So you can, you know, the target separation is way better with down scan. So it's like, again, it's a great tool to teach you what you're looking at on your 2D sonar. And I see a lot of questions popping up here. So I'm gonna hold off to the end here, just a little bit here, till I get to the end of my, two, my, my down scan portion, I'll answer the questions I got. So I don't, it doesn't keep interrupting what's going on or kind of keep the flow going here, but I'll, I will get to your questions. Um, here's a great screenshot. If you're running 2D sonar and you, and you ran across, if, you were, if you're just running your 2D sonar, what I got on the left-hand side here, you see this. 
um, stack of fish. And if you remember on 2D sonar, this is the history on the left-hand side, and this is current data. So what happened, what's going on here, well, I'll just jump over to the right here side. Um, on my down scan, what I found I had down below, there was a stick or a, a post or something that was sticking out of the bottom. And on down scan, it clearly shows that it's a stick or a, some sort of an object stuck in the bottom here. But on the left-hand side, on your 2D sonar, the way that, if you remember right, the way that, that uh, the way that the object enters the 2D sonar cone, is it enters, this was the end of it. So it actually almost looks like fish arches. It looks like fish stacked up here. So if you have an object stuck in the bottom on 2D sonar, it will look like multiple fish because the, when it travels, when this object over here travels through that cone, it gives the appearance of a fish arch. Another screenshot here I thought that was pretty cool is bait fish. Um, lower right hand corner over here, I have a what appears to be just kind of a blob. You know, that you could almost take that as weeds in a way. You know, you know if you didn't really, if that's all you're running was to your 2D sonar. But anyway, but over here, you look on the left hand side over here, what you got going on here, you can see that you can see the target separation, all these items right here. All these, oh, this is all bait fish over here, this target separation right here. So again, um, that's what it would look like. Down scan works great in weeds. Um, so you can see over here, kind of, it's uh, the target separation is spectacular for you know fishing in weeds and stuff like that. Um, 24, 25 feet of water, approximately. And if you looked at, if you're just fishing this on the left hand side of 2D sonar, you just run across that it looks like all weeds. I mean, you could, if you knew what you're looking at, you could probably pick these fish out here, but that'd be very difficult. But over here with the down scan. You can see the fish in the uh, down, you know, you see the weeds right here. There's a patch of weeds, then you see the two fish right here, then you can see the, the target separation, or you see the weed, individual weeds over here. Uh, you can see thermal clines on, there we go. You can see thermal clines on down scan. That, that, um, Screenshot I had earlier on the 2D sonar showing a thermocline. This is the same screenshot, same area right next to it. And uh, again, um, the thermocline on the bottom here, the water, it changes density. It's reflecting back more sound back to the transducer. So you're gonna get, you're gonna you're gonna see this white haze across the bottom here, and that's what you would find. That's what you would that would be your thermocline. And um, so that's, I just want to give you an idea that you can see thermocline on down scan. Bottom hardness on down scan. Well, re, again, if you remember, um, hard bottoms reflecting more sound back to the transducer. It works the same on down scan, is that um, we go from a soft bottom right here, we hit a hard rock pile or a point right here, and then we transition back into a softer bottom right here. So again, over here on the left-hand screen, left-hand side of the screen, there's not as much sound returning back to the transducer. As we move to the right, the, uh, the, you're getting more re echo, more sound reflected back to the transducer. So then it gets, turns white, and then it goes back to a softer bottom. Uh, down scan detail. Somebody asked, can you tell which direction the fish are facing? On 2D sonar, it's pretty darn difficult. I, it's, I've never been able to tell personally, but on down scan, down scan detail is that much is that much greater. So this is some screenshots that came off of Dr. Sonar, and a gentleman um, submitted this there, and he just, it was a pretty cool screenshot. I thought I thought it was worthwhile including, and you can see it looks just like that fish pretty much. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So there is, and again, you have to be moving just right. Everything has to be perfect in order to, I mean, you got to be moving the correct speeds and things like that, and, you know, get some of this stuff. But it is attainable just to anybody can attain these, these screenshots or this, these images. Um, down scan detail here. Again, 
Over here, you can see um, on the top right here, down below here's a side scan. We'll cover side scan a little bit later here, so don't get too wrapped up in the side scan down below here. But I, what I want to do is show you some more down scan detail. Um, these are um, um, out of the Missouri River, and they are, oh my gosh, drawing a blank all of a sudden. Um, but anyway, they are paddlefish. So you can only you can see the, pat, the the beak out here. You can see the tail and stuff like that, and the body right here. Well, okay, let's hit some questions here. Now that we're done with the side scan portion. We probably got some questions on side scan. So, um, okay, bear with me here. Um. Does your outboard blade rotation turbulence affect the, the reading of the transducer? Should I should you mount it to the port or starboard, or can you mount it multiple transducers on the same side? Um, boy, that's a typically now if you're going Jerry, if you're going forward, no. Um, but uh, if you start back trolling, like some people back troll, yes, you can get turbulence. You can get turbulence going across the face of the transducer, and that will give you that will give you. Um, uh, Poor, poor readings and things like that. So, um, and uh, so yes, there, that, that's one that takes a little bit of trial and error. You gotta get that all right. So, Wade asks, so if there is a rock pile or a piece of cover in the cone and you see it in 30 feet of water, assuming it's a 10 foot wide cone, is there a way to figure out where that piece of cover is located or around the boat? Um, on 2D sonar, no, it's very difficult to tell which side of the boat it is on. So, um, why does the sonar lose data signal when traveling at speed? Ken asks. Ken, you're probably got some some transducer setup issues. You may be your transducer set up too high. It is. It may be behind. If you look at some boats, they have a, they have rivets on the bottom of the boat. And you're getting some turbulence across the face of the transducer and things like that. Uh, so that one there is a kind of a trial and error. You may have to move it down. You may have to move it around the back of the boat. Look at the bottom of your boat. But what's happening is you're getting turbulence across the bottom of your, more than likely across your transducer. Austin asked, will I be able to translate most of these learnings to my Humminbird use? Yes. And because uh, basically what we're doing is I'm showing you screenshots. I'm kind of staying away from all the settings and things like that. So again, I run Lorance. That's where I'm going to get all my screenshots from. But uh, it will, uh, you'll be able to translate this information over to that. Mark asks, my HDS 5 Gen 2 have structure scan capability. Mark, if you, is it a Gen 2 touch or a keypad? That's the difference right there. If it's a Gen 2 touch, all you need is the structure scan transducer. The module is built into it. If you, um, well, they didn't make a Gen 2 touch. So HDS5 Gen 2 keypad, you, will, you would need the structure scan module and the transducer. How do you determine fish species? Catching them, typically, or you know what you're targeting. That is, um, or if you, if you know what you're targeting, you know, I, it's a couple of them screenshots on downscan, you can actually see what the fish look like. But, you know, if you're, depending on the size of the fish, I mean, you're fishing larger fish, obviously, you know, bigger fish arches and things like that. But determining the, the species of the fish is basically catching them. Lauren asks, I fished the Pacific Ocean off Vancouver Island. I am trying to identify prawns shrimp at depth of 200 to 400 feet using downscan. That is reaching the outer limits of downscan. I would have to say that is probably where you're going to need um, uh, you're going to need uh, like a chirp sonar set up for yourself for Lauren. That's what probably I'd say would be your best bet. Again, um, that's stretching the limits of downscan that far. Um, Donald Campbell asks, I noticed with the down scan, is it always at 455 or can it be changed or should it be changed? You have two settings there. You have Donald, you have 455 and 800. 
And um, we'll go over that a little bit in the settings here a little bit later on. Um, Dan Kelly asks, any preferences for palette colors for both side scan and down scan? We'll go over that a little bit, in the, Dan, we'll go over that in the settings a little bit. But typically I prefer the blue palette color. Um, I would say you can jump around and try and see which palette color works the best for you. I typically bounce between either the brown or the blue. Are the settings the same for a small screen unit compared to a larger screen, or is there something you need to change to see better bottom detail on a smaller screen? No, Paul, typically they're, they're, they transfer across the board, small screen versus big screen. Um, sometimes the unit will, the, you know, like the unit itself being a small, you know, let's say like a Elite versus an HDS or something like that will, will affect your settings. Once you identify fish on the sonars, what is the best way to get bait onto those fish? Mark the fish, turn on them, course the ground extension, line up a waypoint, and then use the scale on the course of ground to know how far the pitch the bait. Um, well, basically you can you can drop a waypoint on them and you can turn around and go back over to them and you can drop on them and, and uh, yeah, you, can, uh, um, you can do a course of ground extension and uh, travel back to that bait or that, the, that fish. When you mark fish on downscan, how do you tell if it's on the right or left hand side of your boat? It is very difficult, just like 2D sonar. Um, basically, your, your sonar, your, uh, your uh, transducer cone is um, collecting data and it's printing it out in a 2D or basically just a straight up and down pattern on the front of your, on your screen. So if you can see that one screenshot, you know, the fish just travel basically straight through there. So it's, it's compressing all that information to a vertical line. And um, that's where you would find your side scan would work. Are you running mainly, we'll get into that in a little bit of settings. Um, Tim asked, what's the effective range for depth and down scan? Um, that's gonna vary by manufacturer. Um, I guess each manufacturer, you know, like Lawrence, you know, every couple of years they come out with a different down scan. They have the LSS-1 and uh, then the LSS-2 HD. And now they got the structure scan 3D. And each one of those is a little bit different. So I guess you gotta look and um, look at your, you know, wherever's you know, when the OEM comes out, look in your manual, and that'll kind of give you a rule of thumb what the effect for ranges of downscan. Okay, let's move on here. And uh, again, I'm going to try and get to all your questions, but I got to keep this flowing here because we're going to be here all night. And, um, but uh, let's keep going here. Oops, close this off here. Okay, sorry about that, I jumped screens here too quick here. So what we're gonna talk about now is a side scan technology. And side scan basically covers um, out to the side of your boat, um, I probably did, I believe I forgot to mention on the down scan cone angle, typically it's a one to one. So this center section here, I apologize for that. Um, down scan is typically a one to one. So every one foot of depth is uh, one foot of width. So it's basically a 45 degree angle is what the rule of thumb is for down scan. So you can figure about a 45 degree angle off the back of your boat. So it's about a one to one. Um, Side scan is going to vary the cone angle and stuff like that, but typically we're going to, what we're going to cover now is this section here to here and here to here out to the side of the boat. And then um, if you look down below here, remember I mentioned that the, trans, that the uh, cone angle front to back was narrower versus more circular. So this is a representation of what the cone angle approximately would be front to back. Same with over here. So we're gonna talk about this section right here. 
off the side of the on the side scan technology. Again, jump just mention quickly that every manufacturer is a little bit different on the amount of range that you can see out to the side of your boat. Um, it's uh, typically you got 455 and 800 hertz, and so in each manufacturer actually has when you got 455, it'll it, the distance is actually different than 800 hertz off to the side of the boat. So what I got going on here is a kind of a representation of this should actually is a little bit off right here in the center. There should be a blank spot here where the side scan is or down scan is right here. But uh, I just wanted to give you kind of an idea what the down scan or side scan would do. It reaches out to the side of the boat. This is what it looks like in comparison to the 2D sonar cone. Now, side scan travels differently on your screen. The top of the screen is the newest data with the boat traveling this direction. So our boat would be sitting here and then down below here is history. So if you have down, if you have side scan, it's going to basically travel top to bottom. So um, side scan view, I, what I got here is a um, just a breakdown of what some of this stuff is when you're looking at it and just kind of give you an idea of what's going on here. Um, so we'll start here with this orange arrow right here. What we have here is a transition from soft bottom to a hard bottom right here. So you can see a little more echo return up here. It's a, it's a harder bottom. Remember, transducer, the more sound it reflects, the whiter it is on, on, on your structure scan. So now down here, we have a blue, a softer bottom. And then um, moving over here, what we got is a change of depth. So what we got here is a change of depth. Um, the boat is traveling from a um, deeper water to shallower water. And um, so what's happening is, is this center cone is getting narrower. This is closing in. So this, this area here becomes narrow. The shallower the water, the narrower this gets up here. Um, what I got here, the yellow arrow, arrows over here are fish on transitions. And I'll show you a little bit how to identify fish on side scan technology over here. But these, this would be fish over here, these white dots. Um, the green circles are bait fish right here, right here, and right here is bait fish. Now, somebody, a lot of people keep asking if you can ID which side of the boat fish are on and with down scan or with down scan of 2D sonar, it's very difficult. Now, 2D so, or a side scan, you can. Obviously, this is the front of the boat right here, the boat's right here. This ball of bait fish would be on the left-hand side of the boat. The reason these two are split is that this, this ball of bait fish is intersecting that that down that center cone in or the inside edge of this the side scan cone. And then um, my blue arrows here again are pointing towards hard bottom, and then my purple arrow is soft bottom. Side scan view of what fish look like scattered on a hard bottom or sandy bottom. Um, again, here, just touch base real quickly here. The reason I'm saying this is a flat bottom is that this edge right here and is that this edge right here is, is straight and this edge over here is straight. If we were traveling, again, if you look, think back to the last screen, if we were going shallower, this would now be narrower, this would narrow up. But I want to give you a good, good idea what fish look like on side scan. What we got here is these white spots right here um, are fish off to the side of the boat. And um, the reason I say these are fish is that if you see the, see the shadow on the back side here, right here, the fish are suspended and um, the, I guess these kind of the, one of the ways I always explain side scan is that it's about shadows shining on something. So if you walk out into the, your yard and the sun is shining and you see a tree and it's attached to the bottom or a log or something that's laying on the bottom, the shadows attached to the ground. 
But if there's something hanging in the air, like a ball, if you took a ball and suspended, or, or say a plane flies over, you always notice that the shadow is not attached to the ground. And that's kind of what it is right here, um, over here on this side right here, is that the fish are, there's a, there's a separation between the shadow and the fish right here. And over here, these fish are, these are fish that just are sitting real tight to the bottom right here. There's a fish right there. So this is kind of give you an idea what, you know, fish like that would be. Now, fish and rocks are very difficult to distinguish between the two of them because they could look very similar because um, side scan or and down scan, again, reflects sound. The harder the sound, the wider the echo return. Um, one thing I will tell you on side scan is, um, for example, you see them in 13 feet of water. If I had my distance set at, let's say 200 feet off to both sides, everything on the screen becomes very small. The less distance I'm covering with side scan, so if I use range, less range or zoom it in, it's basically like zooming it in. So if I had to set at 150 feet, on both sides of the boat, all these objects have become very small, very hard to see. So what I typically do on side scan is I will take my sonar out of auto range and adjust the range manually. And um, so what I so what I did here is I took and had had decreased the range, so I only had sixty feet to both sides of the boat, and now everything everything becomes bigger. Um, another screenshot here. Shows boulders, small, again, like I said, oops, I remember I got a little delay here. Um, boulders, boulders and fish on the bottom are very, very hard to tell. I mean, so this arrow here is showing boulders up here, but again, it's very difficult to tell what they are. Next one down here, some logs. You can see how they're laying out like this. Now here on the right-hand side of the screen, fish suspended over the drop-off. What we got here is a drop off right here. And um, this, you know, this spot right here. So if you think about it, the transducer is, is sending a signal out to the side and it's reflecting sound from right here back to the transducer. And then this, the signal is continuing on. And so you're getting a dark spot right here because there's no sound reflux. So there's no sound re being reflected back to the transducer right here, but if you but if you continue on right here with the angle, the um, the uh, um, bottom is reflecting sound back to the transducer. But here you can distinguish fish off to the um, off the edge of this drop off right here. Um, again, drop off shadow. Anytime you got a drop off, you're going to get a shadow right here, so you can kind of get an idea that the this area right here is not wavers up and down so you get a longer shadow here so this is probably a deeper break right here than right here this is a real shallow portion right here and then over here we got a boat um, same screenshot as I had earlier what we got here are um, paddlefish on the Missouri River um, it's I, I told you down below here, here's the same fish right here. You see the cursor right here, and it's over this fish right here. So that's the same fish right there and right there. And again, um, determining the shadow, uh, fish are suspended in the water column. And so this fish right here is casting a shadow here. There is a fish casting a shadow right here. And so on and so forth. So what we got here is a is a couple of fish suspended in the water column. Uh, side scan is great for weed flats. You can you can cover a lot of ground with weed flat on cover a lot of ground looking at weed flats and things like that. So what we got here is we're only in 12 feet of water, but we got um, various weed flats in here. So if you're going across, so you don't have to go over this, you can drop a waypoint over here. Oh, shoot.
hold on a second. I just had a technical difficulty here. Let's see here. Hold on a second. Something just happened here. I just lost my... There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Something must have happened, a little glitch right there. So um, anyway, so, um, so what we got going on here is some weed flats going on here. So you can look on the, actually you look on the right-hand side, you can see the down scan view of that weed flat right there. At the edge of the weed, top of the weeds drops off. And so that's, um, you know, again, that's this area. This right here is this over here. Um, side scan view of a of a hard point, and uh, this is uh, this is what side again. This is um, side scan of a point. You can see scattered boulders and rocks above it, and um, what's kind of we train we go from a soft bottom right here. This is all soft bottom right here where it's darker. Then we're moving up over a hard bottom point, probably a rocky point of some sort. It's reflecting more sound, then we're transitioning off here. So you can see right here the, the water column, the center section right here that's being covered would be covered by your down scan. It's um, deeper than we hit, starts coming up right here, gets taller and taller, or it gets, it gets shallower and shallower, actually, I meant to say. So this is gets narrower and narrower, and then we get wider here. So we're dropping off in the deeper water. Um, composite of all three views. Here's a down scan down below here. Oops, sorry about that. Down scan right here. So I wanted to give you a good idea what down scan looks like. Here is a bunch of bait fish down here, a school of bait. Um, side scan right here in the left hand, upper left hand corner. This is what the bait would look like here. You got your bait cluster right here. We got some rocks are coming up on a rocky point right here, some sort of rocky ridge. And over here on the right hand, upper right hand side, is we got a we got a uh, you can see the bait fish are clustered right here, but it's hard to distinguish them right here. And um, but here's a good example of of a, going from a soft bottom right here to a harder bottom to get more echo return, and then we're on a rock pile, and it gets gets it's getting shallower over here, or getting deeper. I meant to say, sorry about that. Um, similar screenshot, just I wanted to again show you target separation of um, what down scan looks like versus 2D and then your side scan over here. So you can see the fish scattered on your side scan right here, both sides, and then your down scan right here. So let's. Uh, Back up here, I'm going to maybe try and catch up on a few questions here we got going on. Let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Is there any truth that scroll speed should be matched to set to the boat speed? Um, on Lawrence, on on side scan and down scan, there's only one scroll speed. I believe on Hummingbird, you can adjust the scroll speed on that. Um, I typically, it, I find, a, you know, it, um, it uh, stays, you know, it's, what I use is, you know, I run standard, just leave it as is. Um, so side scan does not include the bottom. So side scan does not include the bottom, the down scan covers. So if you are just running side scan, you would miss the bottom directly beneath the boat. Yes, you would, Tyler. Yeah, so if you're just running side scan technology, just running side scan, you will only get what's on both sides of the boat. You will miss what's directly underneath the boat. 
Um, Rex asked, how do you decide what your ping speed should be set at? Typically, they mine at maximum, and that's uh, you know basically default on mine. On structure scan, there is no ping speed to set. Um, William Watson asked, what is the approximate ratio for depth to side scan for distance for the best quality image? Um, that's where I take mine out of auto and I, I set mine. I adjust it manually to get the best picture quality. It's all just rule of thumb. If I'm in shallow water, I will zoom it in or use less distance to the side to get the best picture quality. As I get deeper, many times I will set it all further to cover more distance. Al asks, so with side scan and 15 feet of water, you don't see what is under the boat for 15 feet on each side. Yeah, typically you won't. That's where you run your down scan. Dave asked, what depth will you be able to see fish and structure on side scan? Um, Lawrence HDS Gen 2 with side scan module. Um, I run mine as shallow as a couple feet on the river, and I can see, you know, let's say, a, like, for example, a river down here, if I fish like shallow water flats where it's only like 60 deep or something like that, there as well tuck the range in tighter, don't use as much range. And I can, you know, I can see out as far as that cone will reach. Again, um, you got to kind of look at the specs of your structure scan. Again, 455, typically you'll see out further than 800 hertz. Um, so you got so you got to go between the two. And um, that's what I. That's kind of the rule of thumb on many of the, some of the stuff nowadays. Is that 455 will see out further than 800. Um, if you have chirp technology for better for better target separation, does the target separation resolu resolution get better when combined with down scan? Um, now, Lawrence, you can't run them both together, so um, you can, um, you'll get better target resolution with chirp, and you'll even get better target resolution with um, down scan. Benjamin Hambrick, what would a shell bed look like on down scan and side scan? What you would probably find is a very hard echo return, probably a lot of little, you know, um, you'd find a hard bottom which is, you know, shells are hard, you would get a harder echo return, um, depending on how fast you're going and things like that. You could possibly, you could pick out the individual, you could see an individual shells, but a, a hard, a shell bed will look like a hard white echo return, very similar to that point I went over, or that say a flat bottom, it would be white, you're returning more sound back to the transducer. Sean asks, can you drop a waypoint using side scan to point? Would it be accurate in real time? Yeah, I can, I'll, for, yeah, Sean, I can, I'll, uh, it's a great search tool. I will take and scroll back and drop a waypoint on items I see behind me. So yes, you can get a pretty good idea where it's at. So if you're going over an object on side scan, so you see a brush pile over, like those weed flats I showed you that I had that screenshot of, you can scroll over, drop a waypoint, maybe on those individual pockets and get a little closer, maybe do some flipping in those, in those pockets of weeds. What is the depth versus the cone range ratio on side scan? That's what Mark asked. That varies by manufacturer again. Um, I, you know, Lawrence has had LSS1, then the HD, and now they got the structure scan 3D. And each one of those is different. And I know Humminbird is different. Um, the, so you gotta kind of, you gotta, Look at your manufacturer specs. I mean, I'm that's where I'm not going to go into all like get into all those nitty gritty things. I'd be here forever. Um, again, Mark asks: Is down scan and side scan included as part of the structure scan module, or do you need to purchase them separately? On on the Lawrence unit, depending if you're if you got an older HDS like a Gen two keypad, it's a it's a module and it it um, and it comes in module and transducer. And those two are included together. So if you buy the structure scan module, you will get side scan and down scan. And on a Lawrence HDS Gen 2 Touch or Gen 3, that down scan module or that, that structure scan module is built into the unit. And you then just need the transducer and you will get both together. Um, 
Michael asks, what is the best cone for shallow water? Again, that's, um, I'm just using my Lawrence for a reference. I find that 455 is better for shallow water. It sees out further. Now that's all changed now that they came out to structure scan 3D. Someone told me that they turn off their down imaging and side imaging when they are fishing because it scares the fish away. Is there any truth to this? Mm, you know, boy, you'd have to be sitting right on top of fish. Some people do, when they're fishing real tight, may shut off all their electronics and just be super quiet in your boat. But no, I mean, it would be just like your 2D sonar. Um, it's sending out a signal. I personally haven't seen it scare fish away and things like that. But uh, so no, no, I typically I've never shut mine off. Like I said, there's some guys that when they get into a situation where it's very shallow water and they want as quiet of a footprint as they possibly can, they will shut everything off. But you know, there again, if you're moving around your boat, you drop something on the bottom, that's gonna scare everything away. I mean, that's gonna create more sound than let's say your sonar. If you are fishing in eight feet of water, you see a wider range at the bottom if you're using down scan compared to 2D sonar, Dan asked. Yes, you are. You will see a wider cone on the bottom again. Remember that 2D sonar is typically about a, you know, for every three feet of depth, you get a one foot cone, uh, one foot distance. Um, side scan is typically a one to one. So um, it's you will see more distance with down scan versus a 2D sonar. And that's why sometimes if you see stuff on down scan, you may not see it on 2D sonar because the cone is wider. So let's say you go over a school of fish or you go over a fish, you might, and it's not covered by the 2D sonar cone, but all of a sudden you'll see the fish on the, on the down scan cone. That fish is outside of the 2D cone, sonar cone. Barry asks, dragonfly chirp higher frequencies, what does this look like compared to Lorance? To be honest, Barry, I could not tell you. I have not run a dragonfly chirp unit at all, so I wish I could answer that, but I have not used that one. Uh, William asks, what is the best speed for mapping bottom and how much impact does wave action have on image quality? Um, typically on side scan, you want anywhere less than 10 miles an hour. And I typically say that, you know, six miles per hour is probably your best speed for um, side scan to work the best. You can go down though, you know, as long as you're moving, you will, you can, you know, you can, it'll work. But like I say, um, anywhere from two to six miles an hour, that say is very good for side scan technology to give you a good picture of the bottom. And does wave action impact quality? Yes, it does. Um, it, the boat's moving up and down. Here, um, if you look right here, on let's close this out right here. See right here on the screen, Dave, the little ripples right there. There was probably some rocking in the boat like that. So you're going to get a little bit of a ripple action in the bottom. Um, we're going to move on here a little bit. We're going to try and keep this thing flowing. Again, if we'll try and get to the end here. And um, those of you that want to hang around, I'll try and get to all your questions. So let's kind of keep this flowing here a little bit. Um, what I did is I touched briefly on Structure Scan 3D. It's new from Lawrence this year. I have not had a chance to actually use it on the water, but I just thought I'd give you guys an idea how it works and what it's all about. So um, how it works, it's uh, collecting lots of data. So this is a transducer, what a transducer would look like on structure scan 3D. There's more crystals to it, um, more elements inside here, so it's collecting more data. And what it's actually doing is, this is what it looks like on your screen. Top here would be your boat. It actually shows you the actual cone angle right here. This red outline right here is the actual cone angle. It shows you the coverage that you're getting. And then, these orange spots in here are actually fish. It 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 will highlight fish in in the in the in the um, in the uh, up in the water column as this orange right here, and then also it actually gives you an actual three D 
representation of the bottom. Now remember, structure scan or side scan is a flat plane, 2D. It's just flat, but you can interpolate what what's up, what's down, what's you know what's a, what what a ridge looks like, and things like that with it. So um, anyway, here's just a little bit of a here's a kind of a side by side or a comparison between the two of them right here. So structure scan on um, side scan on the top right here. So you can see everything's in a flat plane. So then your 3D, your this is your actual you know, right here is your boat on side scan. So your boat's at the top of the screen. And then on structure scan 3D, your boat is right here. And so everything that's behind the boat is this information right here. So it's basically taking this, tipping it up on end and looking at it from the from, from the back side. So you're getting actual 3D representation of the bottom. There are some settings inside of this thing that you can enhance the bottom and, and, and make things bigger, larger, or flatter. But these arrows are just kind of representing what the bottom would look like. So you got a hump right here. And this is what this is right here. Over here, this is what this is over here. So um, just a representation of what it is. And this is all I really got on structure scan for 3D right now. I really don't have much information on it right now. Um, so settings and tips, we're going to kind of run through this real quick. And then when we get to the end of the question and answer, I'll go run through everybody's questions here. So, um, so yeah, we've been here for, I guess an hour and a half almost. So we're, we're run through some of these settings and tips I got going on here right now. Um, now. Again, this I'm kind of using this off of Lawrence's type stuff, what I'm used to using and things like that. You can interpolate and things like that if you're running a, a hummingbird or things like that. But on 2D sonar, I typically leave my sensitivity on auto. I typically leave my range in auto, my color line in auto. Um, frequencies, typically 200 hertz. Um, we'll go over the set. I got some better screenshots of some of these at some of the 283. But uh, again, what I found is that now that my uh, run chirp for two years now, is that so I'll flip back and forth between 200 hertz and chirp. So that's one thing I can say, it's kind of a, um, you gotta learn trial and error by um, jumping back and forth between the two of them. Palette colors, personal preference, and I got some comparisons coming up here. Uh, ping speed deck came up a couple of times. I have always run mine in max since max is best for looking for fish on plane. And since it makes it simple, I just leave max mine and max and it works all the time for me. Um, you can change the ping speed if you're getting to decrease, if you're getting crosstalk, you can maybe try and decrease the, the, the ping speed to get rid of some of that crosstalk. Um, down scan. On Lawrence, you can adjust the contrast and things like that. Typically, in contrast, leave that auto. On downscan for the range, I'll leave it in uh, the range. I'll leave it in auto. Palette is personal preference. Frequency will be will vary based on the manufacturer and the software revisions. Um, your typical choices are 455 or 800 hertz. Use the one that gets you the best picture quality. And again, there's different software revisions within the manufacturers and different transducers, different, um, you know, LSS1, HD, now Structure Scan 3D, and each one of them is different. Side scan, contrast, I usually run that auto. Range, decrease the range. Range, I run that manual. Decrease the range to gain the best picture quality based on depth. Less range in side scan is equal to zoom in 2D. Distance of each varies by manufacturer and software revisions. Again, if you, we could be here all night long just talking about the different ranges and things like that. So uh, again, we could, again, you gotta look at what you got and then work within the parameters of what you have. So, and uh, so anyway, uh, frequency will vary based on the manufacturer and software revisions. Again, your choices here are 455 or 800. And I just got down to use whatever one gets you the best picture. Um, I ran Hummingbird for a couple of years and I found that 800 gave me a better picture than 455. 
the early LSS1, 800 gave me better picture quality, but then I found as HD came out that the 455 actually worked better. But now that the 3D is out, that's going to be total, a totally different animal. Um, this came up a couple of times, 83 hertz versus 200 hertz. 83 hertz is a 60 degree cone for longer fish arches. Um, it's typically a, a 60 degree cone, which is about a one to one. So you'll get a wider, you'll cover more bottom with a, because it's a bigger cone, a, a wider cone. You'll get a, you'll get the, get more bottom coverage. And because the cone is wider, your fish arches are going to be longer. And I got some screenshots of that. 200 hertz is typically your 20 degree cone. It'll give you shorter fish arches because the cone is narrow, where the fish are in the arches in that, in that cone less. Um, I use 83 hertz for to try and uh, resolve crosstalk issues. So if you're fishing in a pack of boats and you're getting a lot of crosstalk, most of them are probably running 200 hertz. You can try and switch to 83 hertz frequency and see if your um, crosstalk issues go away. 83 hertz works well for downriggers again because of the fact of the wider cone. You get more coverage. And down here, I just kind of reiterate again, 200 hertz cone coverage is for every three feet of depth, approximately one foot of coverage. And then 83 hertz cone coverage, one foot of depth, one foot of coverage. Uh, palette colors. Um, here, this question came up a couple of times, and here we're going to cover it right here. So, palette one on the left hand side here uses yellow as the strongest signal strength and blue as the weakest, with the background as white. It is much better for bottom hardness, but if you look closely at the images, the fish and bottom hardness differences are different, differences are, are seen on both palettes. So, um, over here on the right-hand side of the screen, it's very easy to dis distinguish the bottom hardness. Right here is hard bottom. We transition into a soft bottom right here, less echo return, less sounds being transmitted back to the transducer. As we transition back into a hard bottom, you get more sound um, reflect, more sounds being reflected back to the transducer, and so that this band becomes wider. And if you look over here, and this is uh, palette two, which is a brown bottom, which is kind of cool sometimes, but bottom harness is very tough to distinguish on 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 the on this brown bottom palette on this on this color palette. You'll see that again, harder bottom right here, it's a little brighter, but as you go over soft bottom right here, it gets a little darker, but it's harder to tell, and we transition back into a hard bottom. Fish are easier to see with this brown bottom as you can see here on the left hand side of the screen right here we got a fish that's tight to the bottom on the on, with the palette color number one this fish is tight to the bottom and right here and so it's very hard to distinguish between the two of them uh, sensitivity sensitivity again i typically leave mine in auto Oops. Sensitivity, I typically leave mine in auto um, for most of the time. Um, what you got over here on the left-hand side of the screen is a sensitivity set very low. And it, I mean, it cleans up the screen nicely, but you lose a lot of what's in the background right here. So, you know, if you look to the right here where this is sensitivity set in auto or 0%, um, you know, you, you can see small fish back up here in the water column and things like that. You know, the bigger fish, are right here, you can see it here on the right hand side, and you can still see it on the, on the, on the left hand side here. But if you clear the screen up too much, you're not going to see what you're not going to get the full picture of what's going on. And you can see the weed, these are weeds right here, they kind of wash out a little bit. And over here, the uh, or I mean, over here, they will kind of wash out a little bit. But the sensitivity typically set where you know, an auto right here, though, you get a nice clean, you know, you kind of see them right here. So so basically sensitivity changes how the echo strength is displayed. Sensitivity isn't power. It's different for it's different for water, depth of water. Auto sensitivity works well in most applications. And um, sensitivity is like the volume of a, on a radio. 
The radio receives a signal from the tower and the volume control raises and lowers what we hear. The sonar receives a signal from the transducer and the sensitivity raise control raises and lowers the level we see on the display. Um, palette colors, again, this varies quite a palette colors varies quite a bit um, per for each person. Um, I typically use blue and brown. These two cut palette colors right here for my down scan and side scan. I kind of jump between the two of them. So don't be afraid to try different palette colors. Color line. Color line you can color line you can adjust on Lorance. So right here on the left hand side of the screen is set in what they typically say is 76% or factory default. Over here, upper right. So you can see over here, I'm back up a second. On color line set just right. You can definitely see the difference in transition and bottom. Right here, you can, you can see that we got a hard bottom. We're transitioning to a soft bottom. And then we transition back into a hard bottom. So the amount of sound that's being reflected back and back into a soft bottom. Color line set too high. Everything washes out in yellow. Everything looks the same. I mean, your band is thicker right here, but everything just kind of washes out. And then, of course, set to low. Again, it uh, everything there's no there's no different nice differential between um, hard bottom and soft bottom. So again, I typically leave on a Lorance. My color line set up um, factory default about seventy six percent. Um, I want to go over just touch briefly on Navionics settings. Um, Navionics mapping they got various mapping for various units. Um, the features change by units. And um, just want to touch basically touch base briefly on the differences here. Um, Sonar nautical charts, which is our base layer, is right here on the top. And the fish and chip, aka sonar charts, is that this is a question I often get: is that um, I can't see this extra detail. You got to make sure you got to go and turn on the sonar chart layer if you've got a chip that's capable of running sonar charts. So you got your hot maps platinum and your Navionics Plus. Um, the best way to, I'm not going to go through all the brands of how to do it, but um, each brand is model specific settings. And so if you want to go to the Navionics website, click on the help menu and then type in what sonar you got and it will tell you how to set up your unit to run, to use, get the most out of your Navionics card. Um, tips and software updates. I recommend backing up all your data, backing up your waypoints, routes, and settings um, in case your unit crashes. Um, again, each, each brand is different. And then software updates, I highly recommend keeping those up to date. Um, common question I get is my unit shuts off, my sonar shut off when I'm starting my boat. Well, possible causes there are too small a battery, weak battery, or poor connections. So um, I would recommend running the biggest power supply you can, getting a good quality charger to keep your battery topped off when you're sitting in your garage. Don't skip on wire sizes and connectors. Um, so let's kind of go over some uh, questions and answers. Let's take a look here, what we got going on here. Let's get caught up here. Um, so if you got any questions, I'll try and get caught up in everybody's questions. Um, let's see here. Oh, here we are. Caught I know it's not part of the webinar, but do you have any pictures that can show what of what the 3D structure scan looks like? Al asked. Al asked, I don't, I know it's not part of the webinar, but do you have any pictures you can show of the 3D structure scan looks like? That's all I got for right now, Al. But um, if you go to drsonar.com or Dr. Sonar on Facebook, we got some stuff on there. Um, we got a gentleman by the name of um, Mark O'Neill. He's played a lot of the, with the Structure Scan 3D. He's got some good information on Doc's Facebook page. With the new Elite TI models, do we need 
the structure scan module to do side imaging or are we okay with the total scan transducer Tyler asks. The new Elite TI comes with all that built in there. So if you got the total scan transducer, you will have down scan and side scan technology built into that unit. Steven asks, is there any situations where 2D is preferred over side or down scan? Yes, there is situations where 2D is preferred over side scan or down scan. Um, let's say um, you're open water trolling, um, for example, and you're, let's say you're, and you're fishing for suspended fish, you will be able to see the fish arches on 2D much better on that versus, let's say, a side scan or a down scan. Um, 2D works better. You can mark fish at higher speeds with 2D. Um, so yes, there are some there are some situations where 2D is preferred over side scan and down scan. So um, so you're open water trolling, you're running at speeds, things like that. Um, obviously, side scan has its speed limitations of about 10 miles per hour. You're going to get a really good picture. Um, down scan, you can get see things at the bottom and mark stuff at you know let's say 30, 40 miles an hour if you got your transducer set just right. But uh, no. I would say a 2D, when I do open water trolling, like on the Great Lakes, I'll, I'll be running 2D typically. Unless, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll run 2D and side scan or down scan side by side so I can get a good idea what I'm looking at if I go over something, any questions. So, thanks, <clears throat> thanks Sean, for joining in. Um, and uh, uh, why do my Navanx chips with the fishing chip turned on not show on the same deed pattern? Why do my Navianx chip with the fishing chip turned on not show the same detail and bathymetry as a web app or the iPhone even after it's updating? Um, that's Austin. Why don't you drop me a note or an email and uh, we'll talk about that. We'll figure out. Uh, what is the best mapping card for the new Helix 9 side imaging with GPS? Hot Maps Premier or Platinum? They are dropping the Hot Maps Premium product. Um, rich, so that's no longer in play. I would have to say either Hot Maps Platinum or Navionics Plus. Now, the reason I say Navionics Plus is nice because it covers all the United States and Canada, and it also gives you the ability to download the sonar chart layer of the various areas that you may fish. So, Hot Maps Platinum does come with sonar charts preloaded, but let's say you're let's say you fish south and you decide to travel out of the coverage area of that card. You can, you, one card will cover the whole area. Uh, let's see here. If I had a separate unit on my, to stay 3D structure scan, what unit do you, if I had a separate unit to stay on 3D structure scan, what unit do you recommend, Jeff asked. Jeff, if you want to use structure scan 3D, you will need to have a Gen 3 unit from Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence Gen 3 because that's the only one that's capable of running the structure scan 3D right now. Um, at, uh, the processor and things like that, that's, it's software update allows that. So Gen 2 won't run structure scan 3D. Barry, where could I find Raymarine info on drsonar.com? Unfortunately, Barry, Doc hasn't, has done a little bit on that, but he hasn't done a lot of testing. So, um, so you won't find much information on Raymarine on drsonar.com. I apologize for that, but as we, maybe as get more and more information available. Al asks, is it 2D sonar also the only one of the technologies that give you a meaningful data when you're running, when you're standing still? Uh, yeah, I, you know, Al, yeah, typically, yes. You saw, you know, if I use 2D sonar for ice fishing, and when I'm sitting still, you're, you're going to, you know, the fish are going to, you're not going to get the fish arches, but as the fish travels into the cone, it's going to have a flat line. So yes, you can still, you can mark fish. I would have to say yes. Um, now, if you got your down scan on, anything that goes through that transducer cone is going to be, is going to be a straight line. But remember that the down scan is a narrower cone front to back. So you're not going to get as much coverage area front to back. You get it side to side, but not front to back. So yes, I would have to say if you're sitting still, um, down scan, or I mean, 2D sonar will give you the best, most meaningful data, like you said. But um, uh, so anyway, um, uh, let's see here. What else? Well, I pre really appreciate you guys joining in here. Some of you guys are dropping off. I understand it's getting pretty late. Will Lawrence release 
um, a nine inch version of Elite. I don't know if, about if they're doing a, a Elite nine inch TI. As far as I know, no. Um, let's just jump off here real quick here. Um, if those of you that want to find me, you can find me at uh, kheadquist at navionics.com and uh, give me a, you can shoot me an email and I can send you a link, um, things like that. Um, I just want to give you some, a few things here on the screen right here, some educational resources is that, uh, again, I work at Doc Sampson really a lot and he does have some good tutorial DVDs on his website that cover some of these items like that. So those of you that are running a Humminbird, Humminbird core model, you know, like the show there, the uh, 999, 1100 series and things like that. He's got a very good tutorial DVD on that. He's got some stuff on the Lawrence HDS Gen 2. He's working on a Gen 3. Um, this DVD right here, the Understanding Sonar, Interpreting Sonar, is very good. It works with everything. It gives you an, it kind of it goes into more in depth what we just talked about. I mean, could have gone all, all day with this, but we had so much time. And then understanding structure scan over here on the left hand side. So go to go to his website, check it out. Like him on Facebook. He does have some great schools coming up if you're in the Minnesota area for educational on the water schools and things like that. Um, got a few more questions here. Let's uh, uh let's see here. Curious, have you ever seen a whale on sonar? No, I have not. No, I would not. You know what it would look like? It would look like a large ball of bait fish, more than likely on 2D. You would probably it uh, can ask that. I not many of those in Minnesota, so it would probably look like a big ball of bait fish on there. So, uh, Rex, I have two HDS seven units on my boat, and when I'm using Navax card, I can only get I cannot get the units to have the same detail on both. Is there something I need to change on the settings? Um, Rex, I'm assuming you have Ethernet cable between the two of them. And um, are your software updates up? Are both units running the same software? Are you, are you current on both software revisions on both your HDS7 units? Now, I just bought a boat and it came with a working older Lowrance in the front and a dead sonar unit in the back. I just bought a new Humminbird 899 HD for the back of the boat. Do I have to run them at different frequencies if they are going to be both, both running at 200 hertz? Will they get crosstalk? Al, you may, if you're in shallow enough water, remember that cone angle. It's about a, you know, it's a one to three. If you, until those cones start overlapping, you probably won't get any crosstalk between the two of them. But if you do, you'll probably have to switch one to 83. Um, let's see here. So, um, anybody else got any questions? I hope I got to everybody's questions um, tonight. And uh, I'm not sure who all has various questions and who's left right here. Um, One question here. Uh, basically, um, let's see here. Let's see here. Okay, hold, hold on a second here. We got some stuff. Um, Rex Davis, you should be able to see the Rex, you should be able to see, share the map card between the two units. Um, hmm. There's something in the settings that isn't quite right. It's something in your networking settings that isn't quite right. Um, if you want to drop me a message maybe later on at my email or something like that, we can maybe work through that. But uh, you got a setting there that isn't quite right. You're not um, sharing the data. Um, can you show any images showing the difference between sand and mud rock? Um, let's see here. Uh, 
Um, I got some images. Tell you what, this is an anonymous viewer. If you're on Facebook, hop over to Facebook. I'd have to scroll, shut down and restart everything because there's in the very front of the screen. I'm assuming you're talking on 2D. But again, if you were trapped, if you were following along, um, again, you're going to, uh, well, let's see here. Okay, this is for the anonymous viewer right here. Um, what we got right here is a transition from a, a hard bottom to a soft bottom or a mud bottom and then back to a hard bottom. And rocks will be very similar to that. You may see some, you know, over here and right, right up over here, there's probably some rocks over here, you can, or there's rocks right there. So what you're gonna see is a transition from hard bottom to soft bottom back to hard bottom. You're welcome. I'm glad some of you, if you, those of you who want to leave, please, you know, I'll hang around for a little while longer and um, answer any other questions you got go, going on here. Um, but again, this will all be recorded and edited for future viewing. If you want to jump on, you can listen, walk, jump through it, skip through it a little bit. Um, let's see here. Pat, the new 3D unit will it have a new transducer and any danger of crosstalk Oops. um how much distance will it need between transducers if i keep the old unit and run another transducer that will give me pat um when you get the new 3d if you got a again you got to have a gen 3 it will be a new transducer. You will remove the old structure scan transducer. It looks very similar, but it's a different transducer. It's deeper, it's got more crystals in it, and you will mount it very similar to your old structure scan transducer. So you'll have that maybe just a little bit deeper below so you don't, you don't get any interference. So it'll be very similar to your what you have now for structure scan. Donald, will, will I find the recording of the summer once it's edited? Yes, you will. Um, turn tuned in late, Jim. Don't know if you covered it. Will Gen three and uh, Gen two work together? Yes, they will. Um, all basically Gen one through Gen three will work together. Some of the features may not work, but for the most part, a Gen one, Gen two, and Gen three will communicate with each other via Ethernet. Um, there may be a few items that won't work, like map sharing and a few things like that. But yes, a Gen three and a Gen two. Uh, make sure your software update software is updated in both units. Um, let's see here. Barney, does water clarity affect the reading? Sonar, side scan, and down scan. Yes, it will, Barney. Um, you know, for example, if I fish in the river over here in Minnesota, if your water is very dirty and cluttered, um, you'll find you'll get more feedback on, let's say, 2D will we'll wash out. You won't be able to see anything. Um, We've only had, basically I had an hour to do this and it's, you know, running late, but you know, I could have gone on further and further on this whole thing. Um, down scan and side scan, I find work, work better when the water gets cluttered and dirtier. Um, it seems to, you know, it, it, you get a better picture. So um, on, you can play with, the, play with the sensitivity, turn the sensitivity down on the 2D sonar and you'll kind of clear up some of that clutter. But I found that... Uh, um, in situations where I got a lot of clutter, like in the river in the spring and the fall, that down scan will give me a better picture. I won't see all that clutter. Um, Michael, do you have to use a splitter or a module to link a Gen, HDS Gen 9 Gen HDS 9 Gen 2 touch to the dash my HDS HDS 8 Gen 2? On a, no, you just run an Ethernet cable between the two units, and you can share data. So it's just a, just an Ethernet cable between the two data, and you can, um, and uh, so you can just uh, um, share the screens and so on and so forth. Uh, let's see here. How do you judge that you have the sensitive dialed in on side scan? Um, I think I'm guilty of usually running my sensitivity too high or maybe I'm missing details. 
You know, on SideScan, on Lowrance, it has an auto setting, and I typically leave it on auto. Um, I, like, you know, kind of leave that on auto for the most part. Um, play with a little bit and a um, little bit, but like I say, on SideScan, I typically leave it on auto. Let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Dan asks, with downscan imaging, how much of a range would I see of the bottom per foot of water? Dan, it's about a one-to-one. -one. So uh, if you go down one foot, it's one foot width. You go two to two, and it's basically about a 45-degree cone. Rich, I'm glad you found my Navionics videos on YouTube. I'm glad they were informative. Larry asks, does sand show up as a hard or soft bottom? Sand I will typically show up as a hard bottom. Um, in my, what I've run across, typically shows up as a hard bottom. Because, it, you know, of course, if it's a thin layer of sand. It may not. But, you know, typically I find that sand, as a, shows, for me, shows up as a hard bottom. Ben. I've got a couple of screenshots of strange items showing on the screen. Can you help me determine what they are if I send them to you? I've always, I've always wondered what they are. Yeah, Ben, you can send them to me. Um, again, if you're on Facebook, you can post them on Doc, Dr. Sonar's Facebook page, and um, we can Doc will look at them, and I can look at them, and things like that. Um, Donald, sorry, where will I find the recording? Was it on YouTube or the Navy Annex website? Donald, it'll be on YouTube. It'll be on the Navionics YouTube page, and it will be on uh, my YouTube page, Kurt Hedquist. Um, let's see here. I think I'm st getting, staying caught up with all the questions. Um, did I miss anybody else's questions earlier? Because I was trying to get through this so everybody can kind of get through it. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to drop them real quick here. And again, this will all be recorded. We're going to edit it and take care of it and stuff like that. So you'll be able to view it. And, and uh, if you want to view it in segments and things like that. So let's see here. Michael, so linking the HDS 9 touch in the dash to my HDS 8 on the RAM up front, I just need ether cable, Ethernet cable to see the side scan. Yeah, you, you'll be able to view, share the screens between the two units. So obviously your, your 9 touch in the dash has side scan on it, or side scan down scan's got the transducer, and then you want to run it up to your front unit. Yeah, you'll be able to share the screens between the two of them. So yeah, you'll be able to share screens and the data and things like that. Well, I'm going to give it a few, another couple more minutes here for questions, and I'm going to sign off and call it a night. And um, stay tuned. Oops. Um, you're welcome. Is Gen 1, William, is Gen 1 software still supported? Yes, basically they're not they're not coming out anymore. If you go to the Navy or Lawrence website and you go to their support where it says support software and things like that, whatever's there is the latest software revision, and there will be no more software revisions for our Gen 1 from that you know a couple of years ago. That will be the last time it's been supported. So as far as software updates in that platform. 
Well, I thank everybody for joining in tonight. I apologize if I missed any questions and things like that. There was about 250 people on board here and I tried to keep up with all the questions and answers. So I'm sorry, it's, you know, got a little bit of jumped around a little bit. I tried to keep up with everybody and answer as we went through. Um, again, if you got any questions, you know, you can drop me an email at kheadquist at naviax.com or you can find me on Facebook at Dr. Sonar and, um, or you can go to drsonar.com. So, Anyway, well, you guys have a good night. I appreciate you joining in. Got a little long, but there's a lot of information here. It's hard to pack it in one hour So, with all the questions and stuff. So, hey, guys, have a good night. Thanks for joining. Talk to you later.